All right, it is my pleasure to bring up once again Dr. Anderson. Um, he's going to talk to us about in vitro maturation. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And I'm now going to take you uh, to an issue which I think will become of utmost importance in connection with fertility preservation, and especially with cryopreservation preservation of ovarian tissue. Uh, so what you see here is one whole ovary, uh, and in Denmark we have this uh, uh, principle that we take out one of the two ovaries, and this is of course a very important part in, in what I'm going to talk to you about. So this, just to put that into context, uh, that IVM has been done for many, many years, and this has been done in a context where women have had a short stimulation of three days of FSH, perhaps an HCG trigger, and then it's been taken, the oocytes have been taken out when the follicles has been between 10 and 14 millimeters. This is not what we are doing in this case. Here we are now going down to really small follicles, and then we are aspirating the oocytes from these follicles. And this is a completely different matter because we go far beyond, below what we have done previously. And I, I do think that if we can get this to work with sufficient efficiency, this is a very powerful technique. And it's contrary to what IVM has been used to be, where it's never really been able to surpass or be equivalent to normal IVF procedures. Here, we are in a situation that if we can generate metaphase 2 oocytes, so we can generate sufficiently good quality oocytes, then this is an additional uh, fertility preservation measure for the woman. So this comes from zero to whatever we can bring on board. And I do think that this is uh, very important to keep in mind. But it's, I know Sherman, he wants to put this into the clinic really fast, and this is what we need to do. And I think we are getting there, but I also think that this is now very important that we actually understand the whole process of oocyte maturation in humans. We have an opportunity, and if we can get this right, there's a very powerful resource in here. And this is what we're working at, and this is what I'm going to address to you today. So uh, this is immature oocytes on the background. Probably haven't seen that many immature oocytes before, but they are all mice. So it's a different story. But the whole thing is, what's the rationale uh, and how many oocytes are we capable of collecting from these ovaries, immature oocytes? Uh, and now these are small follicles. Does that mean that the oocyte is different? Is it smaller? Is it more atretic? Or how do they come out? If we want to stimulate with FSH and LH, how do they affect oocyte maturation. We know that this is not a direct effect, so it's via the uh, somatic cells surrounding the oocyte. How is that all regulated? This is where the important and exciting part comes around. And then I'm going to present to you some absolutely new data, and they are just a week old, so they're unpublished, but I do think they're very encouraging and interesting. Uh, so this is what it's all about. And I mean, if you ask any veterinarian, and say to this person, so how would you want to do assisted reproduction in a cow, in a goat, in a pig, or whatever? They would all inviolably and very fast say, we would just take uh, ovaries, unstimulated ovaries, and collect small immature oocytes or uh, from small uh, follicles, and then we'll do it. And if you can do it in all these uh, species, of course you can do it in humans. We just need to figure out exactly how this is coming together. But human oocyte maturation is very different from what you see in animals. And <coughs> Sherman has shown you this picture many times. So basically, it's very good to illustrate that when we do cortical uh, tissue freezing, we are using the outer one millimeter. So you can see that very clearly. That's all the small white dots. That's the non-growing resting follicles. So these are taken apart and frozen. But what we are now looking at is all the rest, is all those follicles sitting in the middle, which are basically the follicles which you use when you start ovarian stimulation. These are the ones which can re be recruited by exogenous uh, stimulation. And this is how it looks when we prepare an ovary, the upper dish, 
the cortical tissue has been isolated. This is all the primordial follicles. This is 90% of all the follicles present in that ovary. The two lower dishes represent the medulla tissue, and this is where the antral follicles are located. And if we can start to use this on top of the cortical tissue, we may advance the complete fertility preservation measure for that particular woman. So we have, I've named the concept two for one. The upper part is what we normally do when we cryopreserve uh, cortical tissue, and the lower part is the new part. This is the part that I'm now working on to find out how we can do that IVM in a good manner. So this is new, the lower part is new. You can see that all the antral follicles there, they do contain oocytes. They're small, the follicles are small, but how about these oocytes? Are they, can we use them for, um, for actually for treatment? So what you see here is just the uh, terminal part of uh, follicular genesis in humans. And you can see here that this is now the last uh, three months of ovulatory cycles. But you can also on the y-axis see the diameter. So the blue square is representing what we do in IVF. But we, what we are looking at now is now follicles with, from 0.2 to 1, 2 millimeter follicles. So this is a very long period that they take in vivo to pass on to that final stage. So this is what we need to accomplish in vitro, is that the maturation processes, which takes three months, uh, many weeks, we need to accomplish that within perhaps 34, 36, 44 hours. So is this possible at all? We need to study this in detail. It's interesting if we start to look at these oocytes uh, compared to what happens in later stages. This is the follicle wheel that Alan Gouchon uh, prepared during his, uh, most of his career. And you can see the different stages and how many granulosa cells they contain. The uh, figures in the inner part, in the inner circle, is basically the atresia rate on the different uh, stages. And if you look at the uh, stages from 2 to 5 millimeters and from 5 to 10. This is what we are using in IVF. He figured out that the atresia rate here was 58 and 77 percent. So a large fraction of those follicles that we stimulate are more or less atretic. The interesting part is that if we go two stages earlier than that, and that's what we are collecting in connection with IVM, it's only 15 and 24 percent. So at this stage, there's far less atresia. So the chances, the number of follicles, the number of oocytes we can get, which are less atretic, obviously are much higher. And this is interesting. So that's one starting point. The other, of course, is that these follicles, we are often saying, oh, but these women are uh, poor respondents and they have very few oocytes and so on. But basically, if we look at it, there is always an enormous surplus of follicles in the ovaries. This is a picture of a um, cortex and the medulla on the lower side of the picture from a 26-year-old girl. All the red dots are primordial follicles. So there's a lot of follicles in these ovaries. And women only use a very small fraction. She may have start uh, menstruating when she's 12, stops when she's 52, 40 years, 12, 12 uh, menstrual cycles a year, 480 oocytes. All the rest are undergoing atresia. So you may say, hey, why are we look what are you looking for? These oocytes will not make it. But I do think that we now know from ovarian stimulation that a lot of these follicles are actually okay. We now know that a woman who's undergoing ovarian stimulation, she may have three, four, five children from that cohort of oocytes, which is collected. So they are okay. And we know now from do stim, so then you stimulate in the luteal phase, the uh, oocytes which come out of that are equally good. So we know that a lot more than just those who reach the final states and ovulation are actually healthy. They may make babies. So my question is, how far back does this go in follicular genesis? We need to study this in order to figure out how many follicles, how many oocytes are we able to collect. So 
The whole starting point, of course, is fertility preservation. And what you see here on the upper left-hand corner is that we're getting one ovary out. And we now start to prepare the cortex. And we, as we have discussed on uh, many occasions here, one millimeter thick, that's where the resting follicles are located. Then we freeze them and we can store them out and transplant them on the lower left-hand corner to the remaining ovary. And then she can regain fertility. What we're now looking at is the surplus the medulla tissue. There's two ways of having oocytes from the surplus. We're getting one ovary out, and as we saw yesterday also, you can actually locate follicles from the outside. You can aspirate them, and then you can have a look to see if you have an oocyte inside, which you see in the middle picture is aspirating. And now on the right-hand side, we have split the ovary in two halves. And when you open it up, you can again see those small antral follicles, which do contain an oocyte. And this is, again, what you start to stimulate when you do ovarian stimulation. So this is one way of getting oocytes. Uh, and if we uh, have the follicles out like that, we would centrifuge, look for the oocyte, centrifuge, uh, isolate granulosa cells and follicular fluid. And this is, we are also using these to study. I'll come back to that. So, but of course, we have all the medulla tissue there. If we start to look for oocytes there, uh, this is surprising because there is massive amounts of oocytes in the medulla tissue. Here is 25 consecutive patients. We published that in 2020. You can see that the average number of oocytes here are 36. This is not what we're getting at on average now, because this series included two or three PCOS women where we collected more than 100 oocytes. So if we get 20 or 25 oocytes, this is really good. But they come out very differently, as you see. Some are having enormous cumulus oocyte masses. Some are naked, and some has a little bit of uh, cumulus cells around them. And this turns out to be of importance. And, and you can let me just point out here that on average we had uh, 11 metaphase 2 oocytes in this series. So that's not too bad. Um, and this is, how, this is how it may look. So you can see a lot of different sizes of the cumulus mass. And if you are not looking very carefully, a lot of uh, embryologists would probably overlook the large COCs, the large cumulus oocyte complexes, because the oocyte is not easily seen. So we split them into three categories, large COCs, small COCs, the lower left-hand corner, and naked oocytes. And then we do IVM. And what we're looking at afterwards is whether they have remained in the GV state, upper left-hand so here, upper left-hand corner on the right-hand panel, and whether they have entered metaphase one, the GV has disappeared, or if there is a first polar body, this is metaphase two, lower right-hand corner is those who don't make it and are tragic. But the really interesting part here is also that some of these very large COCs, they may be 500 micrometer in diameter. So they have an enormous amount of cumulus cells around them. We know that the somatic cells are important for oocyte maturation. So if we have a lot of somatic cells, do we have a better opportunity for us to uh, make the transition to metaphase two? Yes, indeed. It do turn out that the large COCs, they make it in this, this is now three years ago, to 52% of them undergo metaphase two transition. Now we are going, we are close to between 70 and 75% metaphase two oocytes in the large COCs. So they do have the capacity. Uh, what about the uh, diameter? We know that the oocyte diameter is of importance for its ability to sustain metaphase two transition. And the really interesting part here, and you can see that this is an enormous study of 1,500 human oocytes from these uh, uh, immature uh, ovaries, that the mean oocyte diameter is exactly the same as you would get from IVF. So around 110 to 120 micrometers, this is what a human oocyte is. The interesting thing is that these oocytes from very small follicles basically have the exact same diameter. The, uh, uh, the 
more metaphase two transition we have, the higher the, the diameter, but it's still very uh, obvious that they are large. So the black ones, uh, black uh, bars are those which don't make it to metaphase two, whereas the white are those who do it. We have all oocytes, large, small, and naked oocytes, but they are all shifted, those who make it to the right-hand side. So the bigger the oocyte, the better it is. But they have reached their final size. So when do they do that? These are small follicles. They may be 0.5 millimeters in diameter. This is now a study which is actually 50 years old from our laboratory, where they looked at oocyte diameter in relation to follicular diameter in human ovaries. And you can see already, close to antrum formation, around 250 micrometers, the oocyte has reached its final diameter. So this is really good news, and this is very specific for the human species, that this happens. So these oocytes have the right size, and they have the capacity to undergo metaphase two transition. So what does FSH then do to this? Well, you can see here that if you look at the column with large COCs, you can see that the more FSH we are putting into the medium, the more oocytes make it to metaphase two. So we are now talking about 70 or 250 international units per liter. This is very high concentrations. Is this of importance? It is indeed, because these small uh, follicles or cumulosite complexes have very high uh, expression of the FSH receptor. So it do happen that those COCs are very sensitive to FSH. So this is one of the reasons why we can accelerate their meta, uh, the, 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 the rate by which they undergo metaphase two transition. The FSH receptor expression is falling fast. So if you use them on a 10, 14 millimeter follicle, they, they wouldn't do very well. So that's of course interesting. So let's just have a look here. So if we look at the somatic cells around the oocyte after IVM, you can see this is now FSH and LH receptor expression on the upper left-hand corner at the amount of FSH receptors present when we start, and we don't add any FSH, don't change. So we don't have a down-regulation of FSH receptor expression. As soon as we put in a sniff of FSH into the medium, FSH receptor expression becomes down-regulated really fast. On the contrary, LH receptor expression goes up. So the more FSH we are putting in there, the more LH receptor expression we are having. If you go down to the lower panels, then it's the funny thing comes out that in GVO sites, FSH receptor expression maintained to be high but if we undergo metaphase two transition, we have a specific strong downregulation of FSH receptor, but an upregulation of LH receptor. So it appears that the FSH in, hit the FSH receptor, induce LH receptor expression, and the LH in the medium then secures oocyte maturation. So that is something new. So is this different from what happens in vivo? Indeed, this is a histological section of a human follicle where you can see the granulosa cells. Uh, and if we start to look at the FSH receptor expression on, within the follicle in relation to so this is gene expression in relation to GAPDH, you can see that there is 20, around 20, uh, a unit of 25 FSH receptors in the cumulus cells. If we look at the uh, granulosa cells, it's 400. So there's a lot of FSH receptors sitting on the Mueller granulosa cells. What does impact does that have? Well, the granulosa cells, the Mueller granulosa cells, they act as a shield for the interior of the follicle. So there's not a lot of FSH coming in because it's not vascularized, so FSH need to diffuse in there. What happens if we measure FSH within the follicle? If we take small antral follicles and the FSH concentration is 4 and 4.7 in circulation, half of it enters the follicle. Very low concentrations of FSH. If we look at pre-ovulatory follicles, this is now women undergoing ovarian stimulation, 17 units of FSH uh, per liter in circulation, but only three within the follicle. So in vivo, 
the cumulus cells never ever see that amount of FSH which we are exposing to them in vitro. And this is why we are able to accelerate oocyte maturation so much as we are doing. So we have now started to look at what is actually happening when we are doing IVM. So we are doing it in droplets of 25 microliters. As you can see, a dish on the upper left-hand corner, we have droplets where we wash the cumulosocyte complexes, and then each of them are incubated in their separate droplet. And we use a medium which contains FSH, LH, 100 units per liter, human serum albumin, and a growth factor called midkine. So we are interested in now seeing what how does the milieu, how is the environment within that droplet in connection with IVM? If we are going to look at it now in vivo, we can say that the cumulus complex is shaded from FSH action via the mural granulosic cell, explaining why they don't have a lot of LH receptor expression, and they don't have that in vivo. In vivo maturation requires that uh, cumulus cells receive signaling from the mural granulosa cells, where LH receptor expression is coming on. So LH is coming from circulation, hitting the mural granulosa cells, which affect the cumulus cells, <clears throat> which then makes sure that oocyte maturation takes place. In human IVM, we bypass this by putting it into enormous concentrations of FSH. But how does this then affect what happens within the droplet? Well, we have looked at what the oocyte secretes, that's GDF9 and BMP15. And you can see here that in those on the left-hand side, this is the GV oocytes, they secrete around 10 nanograms, 10,000 picograms per mil, which is significantly higher than those which actually enter metaphase 2. The same for BMP15. We cannot see it for cumulin, which is the heterodimer. So somehow, these oocytes, they secrete a lot of uh, GDF9, but if they're induced to, to oocyte maturation, they stop producing it. So that's interesting. We have looked at, uh, in, in human oocytes for the first time, found out that they, the consensus molecular weight of GDF9 and BMP15 are present. If we look at GVE and metaphase 2 oocytes, they are similar. But if we look at the signaling uh, transduction pathways active in the cumulus cells, BMP uh, receptor 2 is the uh, GDF9 uh, signaling pathway, and you can see that that's significantly upregulated in metaphase 2 oocytes, and you can see that the intercellular signaling pathway is SMAT2 and SMAT3, and SMAT3 is significantly upregulated. The same for B BMP15, where uh, ALK6 is the receptor, and you can see that SMAT5 intercellularly is upregulated. So they do something. They do something to these cumulus cells. But what are we talking about? Yeah, maybe it's, it is, this is data from uh, Marty Matsuk's group uh, in, in now 25 years ago, where they looked at, mouse, uh, at rat for, uh, granulosa cells and figured out that if you use GDF9 in concentrations to what we see in the droplet, you actually have an inhibitory effect on uh, uh, LH receptor expression, progesterone production, and cyclic AMP. So the immature cumulosocyte complex, prevent LH receptor expression by having high levels of GDF9 expressed. So in vitro, we make sure that these cumulus cells make LH receptor expression by exposing them to very high levels of LH. And in those cumulus cells that respond with LH receptor expression, LH now activate oocyte maturation. GDF9 is there. It's active, but if it's too, there in too high concentrations, we don't have LH receptor expression. So this is now affecting what happens inside that little droplet. So we have now, and this is the very new data, we have had collected these spent media from these droplets and then looked at what happened to the oocyte and what did actually was secreted to the medium. And we have now looked at GDF9 and BMP15. This is what I've showed you. But we have now looked at AMH, inhibin B, inhibin A, activin A, B, and amphuregulin. 
And we, all, we did that all in one shot from 25 microliters of droplets. So we diluted many of those samples too much so we couldn't measure them. But this is what we got. The AMH was a very sensitive assay. So this was all done by Ann's Laboratories in Houston. And you can see, again, we see a similar picture. AMH, very high in those which remain in GV, a lot lower in those who go through metaphase one to metaphase two. So this is highly significant for AMH and inhibin B, and there's not enough samples for inhibin A and actually in AB. The really interesting part is that if you look at amphiregulin, which is the EGF-related peptide that regulates oocyte maturation, this is completely opposite. We cannot see it in those which remain in GV in metaphase two and met uh, metaphase one and two. They, it becomes highly upregulated. So something goes on within that little droplet. And if you look at the concentration of AMH, it's actually 465 nanogram per mil, which is an enormously high concentration. This is as much as you see within a follicle. So this is now a milieu, which is we are creating in connection with the uh, in vitro maturation. And if we can understand this, there's huge differences between GV and metaphase two. Do I run? I'm not still running over time. Then um, we may have an opportunity to regulate this and understand what happens. And if we look at the AMH concentration, you can see naked oocytes, there's hardly any AMH. There's been a few granulosa cells sitting there. Small COCs is a lot lower than large COCs. And again, the GV is much higher than the metaphase two so this is interesting. We had tested different types of media in, in connection with this. And here is the, uh, on the left-hand side, on the left-hand column, you can see the different compositions of FSHs and LHs that we used. The interesting part is that FSH now, if you look at it in the GVs, when you have 100 units per liter, then AMH is highly stimulated. And if you have 100 units, plus 100 units of LH, it's even higher. So this now turns on, tells us something about how AMH secretion is regulated. This is interesting. So what we are now actually looking at and what we are working on is to try to recreate a follicular milieu within that droplet so that we can recreate what happens in vivo. And then we, our hope is that we can actually generate oocytes, which will be a lot more competent. So I'll just finish off by showing you the concentrations that we generate within the droplet compared to what is present in follicle fluid from small antral follicles and from those we get in connection with IVF. And you can see that GDF9 and BMP15 are around twice as high as you see in the small follicles. So that oocyte is sitting in there and producing heck of a lot of that. And of course, this all goes into the regulation of oocyte maturation. AMH, you can see on average, if we take all, it's 213 nanograms. It's very high concentrations, a lot higher than we see, for instance, in the preovulatory follicular fluid. So this is, uh, there's, there may be functions here where we can we can do something. Inhibin B, inhibin A, and activin are also all present there in high concentrations. We actually know inhibin B and inhibin A are very important for oocyte maturation in vivo in humans. So can we get them to play what we want them to do in IV, during IVM? This is now what we are focusing on. So FSH remain, so what happens, what I think, happens at the moment is that FSH receptor expression remains high in those cumulosome complexes which do not sustain metaphase two transition, which remain in GV. So if you still have FSH receptor expression there, you will generate all these TGF beta growth factors because they are dependent on FSH. But if FSH receptors are downregulated, in turn, you may have LH receptors upregulated. This will induce oocyte maturation, but it also induces amphiregulin secretion. And this is what we are seeing. So basically, this now looks as if we are looking at a mechanism 
whereby we understand how human oocyte maturation is regulated. And if we can manipulate what happens within the, in that small droplet, we probably have a chance to advance this even more. So, and I'll just finish off by showing that my good colleague, Professor Eva Hoffman from Copenhagen University, she has looked into these oocytes that we mature, and they are all, they, they have a, uh, an aploidy rate which is similar to what you would see in IVF. Uh, so, in and some of you may know that the current method that we use for uh, IVM is what is called the Kappa IVM, the capacitation. And the Kappa IVM, they use a 22-hour uh, pre-incubation period and then a 30-hour uh, uh, incubation where they uh, enter metaphase two. And the medium they use for the first 22 hours only have FSH one unit per liter. So they don't stimulate anything. There's estradiol, but then there's CNP. We are unable in vivo to see any effect of CNP. Uh, but so I actually predict that what they're seeing is an effect during the last 30 hours where they are seeing 100 units of FSH in amphiregulin, and this is what they respond to. But I think we can do it better than that. So in conclusion, the snail is crawling forward very slowly, but I think we are getting somewhere. I think the diameter of the oocytes, human oocytes, are good. They are as good as mature oocytes. The tricia rate is a lot lower. So maybe these oocytes are more interesting to focus on than the larger ones. Uh, we have to acknowledge that in vitro and in vivo regulation of human oocyte maturation are completely different. So we are doing something differently in vitro. We need to understand that. We need to get all the factors in play. And it, the FSH and LH receptor expression are key players, the regulation of that. So we need to understand that in more detail. And I think that all these TGF beta growth factors, which are secreted in huge amounts by the somatic cells, play an integral part in how oocyte maturation is occurring and how good oocytes we are getting. So we need to look into this a lot more in detail, but I think we are on the right way. And it won't take long before Sherman can actually start to do this in, uh, in connection with actual treatment, but I'm sure we can improve this over the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that interesting and educational talk. Um, I think we have time for one question before the break. Um, so my question is, you mentioned that the aneuploidy rate is similar to in vivo matured oocytes. Have you seen that fertilization embryo development um, has been the same yeah, no, as in vivo I, matured? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that up front actually. It do happen to be like that, that the Danish authorities do not recognize this as a treatment. So we are unable to use this in connection with treatment. So basically, um, um, I can do research if the woman allows it, but I cannot use them for, for, um, for treatment. But we are now looking for partners out in the big world because I, I guess that this is probably only Denmark where, they are, where the authorities is, is having this opinion. So we, I, hope, I do hope that we can actually establish collaborations where we can test this out now. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, and maybe Dr. Anderson can just stay up so people can ask you questions during the break if they have additional questions, is that okay? That's okay. okay, so we have a 20 minute break. Um, please see the posters if you'd like to see the posters. Please come back right at 3.15 as we have a patient panel, an advocate panel this afternoon I'd like to be on time for.